Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Hope you're all doing very well tonight. We'll give uh, everybody a moment to uh, get a chance to get in, and then we'll get started talking about our topic for tonight. For tonight. For tonight. Uh, welcome, Tim and Chuck and Roger. Hey, Bobby. Good evening. Hey, Debbie. Welcome, Kevin. So I hope everybody's doing well tonight. We're going to be talking about um, 3D terrain maps. These have always been of interest to me, and I got uh, the opportunity to uh, learn more about them um, during the Vetric conference in Chicago. And I just wanted to share a little bit about them for anyone else that uh, may be interested. And we're going to look at uh, where we could find files, how we could bring them into our Vetric software. They are VCarve-tastic, meaning that uh, we can uh, work with them in uh, Vetric VCarve, desktop or pro, um, not necessarily needing a Spire for you know certain file types and things. Welcome Chuck and welcome Jim. All right, it's 7.16. We'll go ahead and kick it off, and as more and more people come in, we'll go from there. So let's uh, switch over and uh, take a look at a typical 3D terrain uh, map. And uh, this photo is courtesy of Digital Woodcarver. Or not Digital Woodcarver, I'm sorry, <laughs> Vetric. <laughs> uh, Vetric. Um, this is a uh, copy of a uh, 3D terrain uh, map project that uh, they were showcasing and things. And uh, I pulled this image up just to kind of give a reference, you know, so you can kind of get that uh, visual in your mind. Now, one of the cool things, there's a few sites uh, that we can go to to pull these type of satellite image terrain type uh, files. Uh, they come in a variety of different uh, file formats. Uh, OBJ, which is a, um, a 3D file model component file that we can bring in to our Vetric software, whether it be Desktop Pro or Aspire. Uh, there's what's called DIM files. Uh, and now the DIM files are, they're much bigger files. And uh, a lot of times there's, there's, issues and things with uh, voids or holes. Uh, they're just a lot of data to crunch. So they're really huge. And so those DIM files would need to be converted and stuff. And there's a couple of options for doing that. But also uh, they would, um, what's the, what's the, uh, uh, the word? They are very, uh, oh gosh, what's the word? Bear with me. Um, tough. Uh, they're such big files. They're very tough for the computer to really process unless you had just a super duper, uh, you know, uh, PC and things there. They, 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 they put a lot of strain uh, on the computer. So what we want to do uh, to minimize that is... Um, we can we can take those dim files and we can convert them to STLs and things 
uh, through some different conversions and I'll be providing links and stuff for you all uh, for these places um, but we can pull dim data from a lot of different things uh, uh, Google Maps or, or uh, various websites and these satellite type images um, if we had a spire or I'm sorry uh, with the dim files uh, it you know it typically requires a converter uh, which is a gadget that's uh, available in the venture gadgets and so therefore with a dim file vcarve desktop since it doesn't have access to the gadgets we wouldn't be able to work with a dim file uh, if you had like a venture vcarve desktop um, now we could also another file type is is grayscales uh, grayscale images but now these are not just typical black and white or gray photos and all these are height map images uh, and we'll look at a couple of samples of some height map images uh, that you would typically find online and with the Aspire program we're able to take these uh, height map grayscales and convert them into a component by just importing them in uh, is everybody getting an echo still? Let me make sure. Hold on. The last time we had an echo, I was receiving. Um, I had audio in two different places. Bear with me. All right, let me know if you're getting an echo now. Um, I have blocked off all of my audio inputs except for my microphone. So hopefully, hopefully uh, that will eliminate it. Um, oh, Debbie, you had two spindle TVs on. <laughs> well, anyway, I, uh, I went ahead and uh, muted all my other inputs except for my microphone just in case the echo was coming from me. All right, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, a website where we could find these uh, type of 3D images and things, um, and a uh, one that uh, uh, recently just learning about. And again, uh, thanks to the help of Vetric and all, uh, is a website called TapoTapo.io, and um, TapoTapo.io. Uh, it's really got a, a wide range of available, you know, um, topographical maps. I, I'm, I want to say they're pretty well covered in the world. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what, you know, what they hit and miss on. Uh, but this is uh, just a, a, you know, of course, Florida, we're, we're flatlands mostly. But uh, this is an area right outside of where I live um, uh, called Lake Weir. Uh, Lake Weir, Florida, Aquaha area, and Lake Weir. If I can turn this around, is this large lake? It's it's the largest lake in 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 I think in the county. Uh, but uh, that's this area here, and I used to live right on Lake Weir, right about here. Um, and so now, for a terrain map for myself, you know, this would this would be interesting. Uh, just like if it was like a little science project, but really there's not a whole lot there, you know. I love mountain ranges and things like that uh, that we could um, really kind of focus on and stuff. But I just wanted to show you this. So let's 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 see if we can find a a place that uh, may have some range. So um, There we go. <clears throat> now, one of the things is uh, we can control with uh, topotopo.io. We can control the zoom. We can control how this uh, this model comes to us. We can also control the height. You know, we can really kind of, uh, you know, really expose the terrain uh, and stuff. So let's see if um, we can find something with some mountain ranges uh, in the chat room. If you know of any good mountain ranges or anything, uh, let me know. And you may experience some buffering, and I apologize about that. Um, I've tried to get the uh, volume down, so I can, but I can see 
that there's some buffering because this program is kind of uh, this particular uh, website is a little taxing so I apologize it looks like I'm buffering a lot uh, so we'll try to eliminate that moving around All right, so I'm, I'm going to go with this uh, little area of the Rocky Mountains uh, range and everything. And I have uh, different ways that I can, and, I, and again, I'm sorry about the, um, the buffering. I can tell that I'm buffering quite a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and let me save this file. All right, Chuck, we'll check out uh, Colorado Springs as well. Let me see if I can save a 3D file here. Oops, hold on, I got too many commas in there. Now we can pull over uh, on the map. We have these four points. We can we can kind of get, you know, we can pull over. Oops, what we want, you know, as far as what areas and everything we want. We have those four points. And let's go ahead and save this file as well. And let's get out of this program. See if I can stop some of this buffering. Yes, Chuck. Uh, We'll get out of this program, but topotopo.io, topotopo.io, and I will uh, type that in the chat room, and let's go ahead and get out of that. So I've grabbed a couple of model files, and now we're going to go into uh, vCard Pro. Now, when these files come down to us, uh, they are OBJ uh, files. And let me see if I grabbed my wrong VGARV. I did. But uh, they're object files, OBJ files. And um, so they're pretty straightforward for in inputting in. Uh, I'm going to go with a 12 by 12. And my thickness on this, because I want to mill uh, some of the peaks and everything, uh, I'm probably going to start off with either an inch and a half or two inch stock. Uh, let's go with a 1.5 inch stock. Now for me, because of my jig that I use, um, I work uh, off of the bottom of my material for my Z0 position. And uh, with my wedge jig, I reference off the bottom left corner for the XY datum position. So we're going to go ahead and set that up. Of course, you would set it up how you, uh, for your machine and, and, and your needs and all, how you would normally set up your jobs and all. Uh, but I work off the bottom for the Z0 position.
Okay. <clears throat> so, to recap on uh, what we're talking about, some of the common terrain data file types uh, are going to be the uh, OBJ uh, and STLs, of course, you know, our standard STLs. Um, these are uh, typically made up of a triangular mesh. Uh, and uh, depending on how many triangles are, are uh, created within this mesh depends on how, you know, clean or tight the, the, the model format is. Uh, we have the DIM files, which is the digital elevation models. We've got uh, the grayscale images. If you have a spire, it would, it would require a spire for the grayscale images. And again, those are height maps, and we'll talk about those in a second. But then we also have um, uh, GeoTIFF, G-E-O-T-I-F-F -F, uh, type uh, images. And um, those are going to be your typical file types that you're going to be working with. Now, with the... Uh, topo topo.io program that's typically when you save the 3d file it's going to be an obj that comes across to you um, we can pull uh, different type of uh, dim files like satellite imageries or scientific data including the moon and the stars you know it doesn't have to necessarily just be on earth um, and these are again they are very taxing. That was the word I was looking for, taxing on your computer. Um, they are truly uh, variable uh, as far as the data type. Uh, sometimes you get holes and gaps. Uh, they're difficult to assemble areas with the raw files as far as... It, it, there may be some things that you could do if you had the Aspire program so i'm not going to really be recommending uh you can do your own exploration on 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 those type of files the dim files and things i'm not going to do a whole lot of um recommendation on that i'm going to stick with the topo topo.io uh because i as far as everything that i've typed into it i've been able to pull a terrain map off of it and uh it's been Really nice, but let's before we get into bringing this file in because it's pretty straightforward. I want to talk about our height maps, height maps, grayscale images, and what you would typically see if you were to look online. Um, real quick to inter interrupt a question, uh, Debbie. No, I still absolutely use my DWC quick set tool. Uh, when I touch off, uh, I put it in the corner of my jig on my 90 degrees uh, to set my X and Y. And when I touch off to my jig, uh, my the uh, the DWC quick set tool is a half inch on the edges. Um, and so I just type in 0.5 uh, when I'm touching off, which sets my waste board as my zero. So how you doing, Howard? All right, let's pull over a... Uh, uh, one more Google page here and let's look at height map grayscales. And if you've ever, you know, uh, looked at uh, various height map uh, grayscales, what we are um, generally uh, looking for is a true height map, uh, not just a black and white image. Um, we don't, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to pull the data because in a, in a height map, the shades of colors, um, these are where you get your different levels of elevation, white being the highest part through the shades of gray to black being the lowest part of the model when it's converted. And again, this would require a spire to, to use uh, with the different height maps. And now uh, when searching uh, for height maps, there's a lot of different uh, uh, websites and things where you can go. You may be able to uh, type in a specific destination and, and try to pull 
a, a height map grayscale of it. I have not explored uh, the height map grayscales uh, to um, a large portion. Uh, you know, to you know, I haven't gone in depth with with exploration of the grayscale images and things because literally I found Topo Topo to be uh, one of the better sites and more user friendly uh, to to get what you want. But uh, I don't want to for you Aspire users and all uh, that have the ability to work with height map grayscale images. Uh, I don't want to eliminate the possibility of you you looking there as well. And height maps are, you know, not just terrains and, and things, you know, generally they would be, but uh, you can get height maps of, of different, you know, that's what a model is. That's what a 3D uh, laser scan of a model is uh, typically uh, creates a height map grayscale. Um, you can find uh, some, you know, planetary type uh, um, satellite imagery um, and, you um, but just a typical black and white is not going to do it. Or, or if you turn your grayscale or, your, or an image into a grayscale in Photoshop, that's not going to cut it. It's a 3D scan um, that, uh, you know, creates the different uh, terrains. But it's not just terrains. Uh, there's, there's a whole, uh, and I don't know why it happened to be, why it happens to show me all the terrains now. Uh, but there's also um, model type files and things uh, that you can find uh, different websites to where you can find some 3D models and stuff that are uh, height map images uh, that you can bring in and convert with, with Aspire. So definitely look at and kind of explore that as well if you have that ability. Um, the grayscale height maps, uh, they import uh, uh, as a, you know, creating a component. Um, the uh, with, within the Aspire um, and then you can uh, take and with your different uh, Aspire tools your your uh, shape creating tools your oh gosh I'm, I don't know why I'm getting brain dead tonight your uh, sculpting tools and things, you can do a lot of cleanup and stuff with it. And that's one of the things. Now, these terrain maps are mostly clean when they come in and all. Uh, with your desktop uh, and your VCAR Pro, you're not going to be able to do any kind of manipulation or cleaning and everything with them. You can scale heights and all that stuff, but real sculpting, if you got to go in and fix holes and stuff, it's not really going to happen. So that's why I'm not a big fan of the uh, DIM files and stuff. <clears throat> and um, we can... Now, another site uh, in another file format is the GeoTIFFs that I was talking about. And this is what you would typically find on the Google Maps interface. Um, and uh, places like, uh, let's go to uh, Earth Explorer.usg. Go. I got my notes over to the right. That's why you see me coming looking over there. EarthExplorer.usgs.gov. Okay. So uh, with this, uh, we have uh, you can enter different search criteria, uh, and you can. Um, you know, whether it be a specific address, uh, coordinates, uh, date range, or what have you. Um, you can uh, choose different uh, data sets. Uh, and these are typically going to come in and ouch, be formatted as a GeoTIFF type file. Uh, and then, you know, there's man there's so many so much to do here um uh, but the usgs uh science for changing the world is the earth explorer uh you can really just kind of uh pull into different areas 
I don't know how much buffering that's going to cause me zooming into that image. <laughs> but um, now the one thing that I haven't tried with the GeoTIFF is if we come, you know, if we happen to go and uh, depending on the criteria and all that stuff, if uh, it pulls in all the like it's, it's almost like Google Maps. So like all the cities and the towns and the streets and everything. A lot of times, uh, you know, I just want the terrain. Uh, I don't I don't know if I want all the highways and the streets. And the more and more I zoom in, um, I can kind of uh, focus in on areas that I want to uh, deal with. But I don't know if uh, if I would want, and I'm looking, it's like a Google map in the most case. I haven't really gotten to explore this site that much, so forgive me. And this is why I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, because I try not to talk about things I don't know a whole lot about. Um, but I want to be able to show you these different sites. And this one is earthexplorer.usgs.gov. Uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, another thing that you can experiment with and play around with. All right, let's get out of there and let's get back to our Vetric. I don't want to confuse the situation. Now, with our terrain maps, uh, it's going to be an OBJ file. It's just like a uh, 3D model component file. Uh, so we would come in and we would import our component or 3D model. We're going to import it straight in through the modeling tab. And we're going to go to our downloads. And my files were called... Let me see if I can see what my files were called. Model and model. Model one, model two, and model three. <laughs> so it doesn't really give a specific name. Uh, it's gonna call it a model. Uh, so model one and two uh, and model should be my uh, Lake Weir type things uh, I believe model 2 was the Rocky Mountains so let's go ahead and bring that in I'll have to go in and rename those files um, uh, so I know what they are other than just model 1 model 2 model 3 but now these are give this some time uh, these are these are still decent sized files uh, and model files and everything uh, when they come in and so now this uh, importing an OBJ is just like importing an STL. We've got to orientate it. It's going to ask us to orientate our model when it comes in because as you can see right now this is coming in uh, on its side in a sense. And so we need and this is what it's referring to as the top you know in the initial orientation. And that's not right. We want uh, I would call this the front uh, so that we get that uh, terrain. Now, all of the meat that's underneath, uh, let's get into a Y plane here. Uh, it comes with a heavy base of, uh, you know, meat underneath. And if we were to bring that whole model in, if we were to put all of this model on top of the Z plane here, then we're going we're gonna to be pulling in all of that straight material which means we would have to have a pretty decent size uh, thickness of material to, to carve with otherwise we would have to try to size down our model and if we do we're going to end up losing uh, a lot of our detail features and everything so what we want to do is we're going to typically uh, use our zero plane position in the model uh, tool and we're going to come in until we, you know, get to a position where, you know, whatever you want, you know, underneath. Now, I'm not going to go all the way to the bottom, right? We don't want to do that. We want to bring our model, you know, in at some point. And I'll probably go there. I would like a decent uh, uh, size piece. And I'm going to size it down right now. It's about a hundred inches by a hundred inches. Uh, and for me, I want to go to 12 by 12. I'm going to go full edge to edge with this. And we're going to go ahead and apply that. 
and then I'm going to create this model, uh, but discard the data, the model, below the zero plane line. And I'm looking at this, if I were looking at this straight on uh, in top view, we'd be here. Um, and notice that I have some little coloration here underneath. So some of my elevation is down below the zero plane. So I'm going to come down a little bit until I get pretty much where it's all red and of course so there's some deep caverns in those valleys and hills and all that stuff and because I'm working in uh, uh, VCar Pro I can't really patch any of those holes so I have a choice at this point oops I moved my model bear with me a second I have a choice at this point I let's get back into the Y plane I either bring my model in as it is and um, just have it kind of ignore the uh, surface of the or you know below that or I take the opportunity or the chance and bring it down to where I want and then I may end up with some voids or holes in my model that I can't just auto fill or fill in with a sculpting tool because I don't have a spire. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to split it. I'm going to center the model, um, just split it down the middle, and I'm going to discard everything below the zero plane and click OK. I'm going to let it bring in this model, and then I'm going to look and see exactly what type of voids and all I may have to deal with that I, I definitely don't want my router you know, uh, trying to dip down into little holes and things. Uh, you know to cut these caverns and all and so as I come in this is the Rockies you know part of them which is a very cool terrain uh, I actually like this one <clears throat> so I can see some areas here and this is where if you did have a spire this is where you could come in and kind of clean up and smooth out some of these areas now I don't have a spire, but I'm going to try my smoothing tool. Um, I can try that. I can try adding a zero plane um, underneath. Uh, I don't know what that's going to do for me, but let's try the smoothing tool first. The one thing I want to make sure of is when I'm smoothing that I'm not going to be taking away all the detail because I love this rough exterior of all these ridges and things and all. Okay, so I'm going to try to pres preserve the transparency and I'm going to take my, let that process, and I'm going to take my slide bar here and I'm just going to bring it up slowly. I'm going to kind of increment my way up and everything. And so you can see as I'm smoothing, I'm actually opening up those holes more. Uh, and as I smooth more and more, it's kind of rounding off those edges and now you can see all the voids and stuff uh, that I don't want because my bits gonna try to go down in there and and open them up and I know these aren't volcano holes uh, they're just uh, an anomaly in the uh, map itself and unfortunately I can't just go in and, and, and clean them up so I'm going to literally uh, keep smoothing off. I'm going to keep those holes to a minimum. And it's almost kind of like uh, seaming them up. I can tell where they're seamed up here in a sense. And we'll go ahead and just, I'm just going to get out and just leave it as it is. That's going to be up to you. I don't, uh, smoothing is just not going to do it for me. And we may open this file up in an Aspire in just a moment and uh, see how we would approach uh, going through and kind of cleaning up some of these areas and stuff. But now that we have our map uh, and our terrain map, now we can go ahead and work on our toolpath. Now, keep in mind with this, I'm working with a 12 by 12 inch piece of material, block wood. Uh, right now, the model thickness, this model thickness as it stands, is um, about uh, a little under inch and an eighth, 1.1181. Uh, 
okay so it's well within my inch and a half block of material and as you can see the model position in the material I'm in my material setup over here uh, it's the light tan area is my model and it's got it at the uh, bottom of the material and I actually want to bring that up now I have all of these hills and peaks and everything and I want these sharp points and all so I want the material surface or the model surface not to be at the top of the material because what is the top of our board it's flat so I'm going to give a little bit of material that has to be milled away before it starts shaping that model so and, and you don't need a lot you know uh, so I'm gonna go with probably about 20 thousandths of an inch uh, I typically would be like you know 10 20 30 thousandths of an inch uh, would just be be enough just enough to skim off that top layer so it before it starts shaping the model and um, uh, so I'm gonna be happy with uh, 0.02 uh, 20 thousandths to start with and all my rest of my setup inch and a half thick material again starting from the bottom left machine bed is where I'm touching off which is my spoil board of my jig and I'm gonna go ahead and click OK to create that material setup or at least uh, you know lock in that material setup now I can start focusing on my tool pass now for this because I do have some deep valleys and things in here um, I do want to do a roughing tool path so we're gonna come in and we're gonna create our 3d rough first now as far as the roughing goes, really it kind of comes down to what you want. Uh, typically your go-to bit is your quarter inch end mill, uh, but if you want to reduce time or anything or need to reduce time, you can always go with a larger end mill. It's just not going to uh, take away or get into some of those nooks and crannies and stuff like the smaller end mill would to uh, kind of get rid of that waste so that our ball nose can go to work um, on the carving. And so I'm going to use my quarter inch end mill and I'm going to use the entire material as the boundary. Now this, because I'm using a 12 by 12 inch board uh, and my model is the same size, I can't very well have clamps on the top of my board, right? You know, so I got to think about alternative clamping methods. Uh, and there's a lot of them out there, you know, whether it be hot glue, uh, the painter's tape with CA glue trick. Uh, double-sided carpet tape um, which I you know I'm not a real big fan of but I had to use it just recently uh, and it did very well can't you know it, it held the material very well it wasn't too difficult to uh, clean up sometimes that sure carpet double side tape is really sticky and leaves a lot of residue behind but this wasn't too bad um, and uh, it met my needs uh, I have a wedge jig uh, when when uh, it permits that allows me to trap a board uh, within kind of a framed area. Uh, so therefore, uh, the and the wedges and everything are all lower than the surface of the material. So I'm not I don't have any clamps in, impeding my movement or in my way. So you got to think about that alternative method. Now, of course, I could also work with a longer board um, and then uh, clamp you know each end I could set my zero instead of on the very corner I could move in one inch you know if I had an inch overhang on both sides or something I could move it in one inch uh, so that my models cut there and then just cut the ends off you know the waste ends off uh, at the end of the job with a table saw or chop saw or whatever the case may be uh, depending on what you're doing but just think about your clamping methods alright so I'm gonna use the material as the boundary I'm gonna let uh, the rough pass uh, mill most of the waste away but I still want it leaving about a 40 thousandths of an inch layer of material above my model's surface my model's uh, surface height uh, so that my ball nose has a little bit of work to do but I don't want my end mill getting oh sorry I have the hiccups I don't want my end mill getting too close uh, to my model uh, and possibly causing ridge marks and things um, <laughs> For this, uh, we're going to raster X or Y depending on which way the grain is going. I always highly recommend carving with the grain. And in this case, I would most likely have my grain running along my X axis. So I'll go ahead and raster X. 
and then we're going to uh, calculate this is Rocky's IE or Y because I know Rocky Balboa you know it's R-O-C-K-Y but Rocky Mountains it, it should be Y as well but is it if it's IE somebody correct me because um, I don't want to look like an idiot on YouTube thanks all right <laughs> uh, Rocky rough and um, I'll go ahead and calculate that Adrian <laughs> Rocky Balboa all right with a Y thank you Howard I greatly appreciate that sir all right so we're gonna go ahead and um, we'll carve this out Now removing the, let's say if I had this and I wanted to carve this, uh, you know, let's say the terrain wasn't too uh, peaky in a sense. I don't know if that's a proper term. Uh, like my Lake Weir one, the first one that you guys saw, which is very flatlands here in Florida. Uh, but I may want to create a little, uh, you know, a nice little memorial type thing uh, for Lake Weir because I grew up on it or what have you. Uh, and something just to have in my office or, or and all. And that is... I'm probably not taking a whole lot of material off and so I could you know get get away with carving that out of a three-quarter inch board and all but a lot of these other ones that have all these nice terrains wonderful landscapes and mountain peaks or whatever the case may be um, then that's when you know I want thicker board because I want this thing to be like pow and, and, and really showcasing all right so here's our rough cut and uh, our end mill has gone to work on this piece, uh, taking away as much waste material as it can. Now we're going to come back and create our finish cut. And for this, I'm I, I'm pretty well uh, safe with using an eighth inch ball nose bit, but. If that eighth inch ball nose bit, uh, and I'll be able to tell after we create it and all, if I'm not getting some of these little, let's let's cancel this for just a second. If I'm if my eighth inch ball nose bit, if I'm losing some of this detail, some of these little ridges and and veins and things in the mountains and all, then I'm gonna you know I'm going to sacrifice time for quality uh, type of thing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna scale down my bit size so it can get into these hills and valleys and all. Um, but you know, for the most part, we'll, we'll go with an eighth inch tapered ball nose. And of course I don't have one in here. All right, so I want a nice tight step over uh, for uh, the finish of this, uh, get a nice uh, terrain. But on the clearance pass step over, this really isn't important unless we were doing some type of uh, V-carving or pocketing or something out of there and there was going to be a clearance pass. Uh, so this doesn't have to be set too tight. Um, it can, you know, so I'm going to bring that up to about 20% uh, because it's actually not even going to play a role in uh, my finish cut and uh, I'm gonna run about 50 and 20 so we're gonna click apply and add that bit in there now on this one again once again I am gonna be using the material as the boundary and we'll go ahead and so we my finish cut and we'll let that calculate now while that calculates um, it's going to take a moment. Let's uh, talk about uh, a couple of things. So the GeoTIFF files, um, this is a 16-bit. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a true height value. Um, 
there is uh, when you're working with uh, the the GeoTIFF type files, um, GIMP, GIMP. Uh, it's a free photo editing software editor for um, uh, photos and things. Uh, it's open source. Uh, and uh, you may have heard of, you know, in combination with GIMP, you may have heard of Inkscape. Inkscape is another good free source uh, download. But um, the GNU uh, image manipulation in uh, the GIMP program uh, is does very well um, uh, with working with the uh, conversion of the geotiffs and uh, preserving, you know, the detail and all. So you because you do have you will have to do some photo manipulation with them and all and gimp gimp the photo the, the free open source uh, photo editing software uh, that would be a good one to work with um, and you can get that from gimp g-i-m-p dot org www.gimp dot org let's see here I'm going to, I've got about, looking at my notes, I've got about two or three different websites um, where we can um, do conversions and stuff, uh, like the DIM file Wrangler and uh, STL conversions and things like that. Um, the uh, Paul Roundtree uh, website, um, I will provide those links in the description of the video. Uh, for the class for you guys to refer to and everything. Um, it's pretty much it. While that's calculating, it's not going to let me really uh, do anything. But I want to come... Well, we'll wait. I want to come back to you guys and answer some questions if you have. Um, <clears throat> is... <laughs> thanks, Howard. <laughs> Howard's like, why? But it's also IES... Uh, so it's your way um, on the maps uh, what I used was the Y cool no raster this time oh good catch on that uh, Kevin good catch on that I'm actually gonna stop that calculation I do not want an offset cut I don't want it going with the grain against the grain with the grain against the grain with the grain against the grain because gosh forbid I do not want to have to sand this <laughs> So good eye on that. I'm going to change the machining strategy to a raster. I will be rastering along my X axis, which is represented by a zero angle. If I was rastering along the Y axis, it would be 90 degrees. Uh, so I'm going to go with a zero angle. So rastering along the X and I'm going to start that calculation again. Thank you very much, Kevin, for catching that um, before I got done with it. Uh, definitely want to definitely 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 want to raster with the grain on a project like this because uh, the minimal the, the the minimum amount we have to deal with it uh, on the bench you know sanding or touching up and stuff you know uh, the better and I could just you know with the grain against the grain with the grain depending on the type of wood that we're carving in um, you get a lot of fuzzies everywhere and it would just be oh because I would be, I'd be a little frustrated if I, you know, had a lot of cleanup to do, and as I was sanding away, I sanded away some of the detail of this map. I like, and want. The whole purpose of the topography map is, uh, the terrain map, should I say, is for that detail, that unique uh, look and feature and everything. Could you use this for lake contours? That's a great question, Jim. Uh, a lot of people are really uh, into uh, lake contours uh, for the uh, purpose of, you know, a lot of times they want to carve them out and uh, they want to um, fill them with resin and, and stuff or, you know, rock or what have you. Uh, the You can find lake contours and stuff in uh, different file formats, and if you're lucky enough to get it in uh, GeoTIFF or, or, or um, image, and, and you know, pulling it up on Google Maps, I when I typed in Lake Weir, and let's see if uh, I really don't want this to buffer a lot on you guys, but let's see here if we go back to 
And please forgive me if we do buffer. But let's go back to topo topo.io. And oops. Let's try that again. Topo topo dot io. I had a typing error. Can we search for a lake and can we get a topography of a lake? Um, you know, kind of the negative. Well, it's only going to get what this, what the laser scans from the satellites and stuff can get. So I don't think we're going to be able to get into the lakes and all. But we can use the same type of thing uh, in that negative fashion because there are 2D maps uh, in things, uh, but it would require a spire. But let's let's kind of see. Um, yeah, Dave, absolutely, I agree with the uh, sanding mop as well. I got the whole little Dremel kit. It's got all these little accessories and all. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of my Dremel. I found the little burring bits uh, nice for cleaning up fuzzies too. The little uh, ball burring, the metal ball burring bits on it for Dremel. All right, so let's see here. If I come in and uh, lake, <laughs> I don't even know how to spell my own Florida lakes. Hold on a second. Oh, God. All right, lake. Okie Choby. That's what we want. Lake. Okie Choby. Let's see if I let's see what it can give me. What it gives me here. I now I've had some pretty good results. Alright, so this uh is in fact Lake Okeechobee. Let's see if I can zoom in and at least give it some kind of body. You know, again, I live in Florida, flatlands, not a whole lot, <laughs> not, a, not a whole lot to see. Um, this looks like a corner of Lake Okeechobee. I can move things over a bit. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. But see, I'm not getting any terrain. I'm not getting any depth, right? I'm only getting that surface. So that's not going to work for us in this case. Um, now, if I came in to Google and I typed in uh, Lake Oak, uh, Oki, Chobi, Uh Let's see here. Um, depth map I don't know what the proper term would that would be uh, Jim but let's go into images let's see what it gives me here So uh, this is a very small, let me see where this takes me, bear with me, uh, let's see if we can, not a very, uh, zoomed in image but what I can do here if I had a spire um, all right we'll try Leech Lake in the contour map but uh, uh, what I can do here with this map if it were bigger I think I'd have to download it to get it bigger 
uh, is the different uh, depths and all, I could actually take into a photo editing software and I could try to give them different shades of colors. Or when I trace this, when I trace this, uh, you know, bitmap uh, in the Vectric software, I can, those lines would be individual vectors and I could carve them at individual depths uh, to try to get that depth map, uh, you know, um, uh, for the lake. So that would be one way that I could do that. Let's take a look at, um, let's see Matt's uh, recommendation. He's saying Leech Lake, not a place that sounds like I'd want to go swimming if there's leeches. And I am going to type in contour map. Uh, And so, again, I could probably pull off, uh, depending on these sites, how they do their file formats and everything, um, you know, I could probably pull in a GeoTIFF file on this and get some kind of contouring and stuff out of it uh, and um, uh, work with that like we talked about uh, But I could also carve, you know, if I had to do it manually, I could go through and carve different depths based on the vector lines. That'd be a whole lot. Oh my goodness, that'd be a lot. Um, but we do have some mapping and uh, different terrains. So we may be able to, uh, if this is a satellite image website, depending on what Northwood Mapping Company does, I can probably get some data file, whether it be a DIM file or a GeoTIFF file. Um, I, could, uh, I could work with this and we could do it the same exact way. We just, with those two files, we do have to do a little extra work on the front end. Uh, we, we, before we can, you know, get that model of a sense. Um, and I would, it would require a spire. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do this or turn this image or a geotiff image or a grayscale image. I wouldn't be able to turn it into a 3D model within uh, VCarve Desktop or VCarve Pro. Uh, but if I could find this file or a website that basically has some type of three-dimensional I don't think they would I don't think there would ever be one out there unless somebody's doing some sonar you know what I mean scanning <laughs> um, but you never know uh, if I could find a model component file OBJ STL something like that great otherwise we're doing the legwork on this one so lake contours very popular people love to carve them out like I said fill them with resins and things um, Stephen Allen, one of our customers, uh, did a nice little contour uh, not too long ago with a resin. It looked really great. Um, I may have to get him to share his tip in the group or something at one day and come back and revisit this. Um, but I can work off of these maps. And seems uh, typing in the keyword search contour map, uh, you know, uh, really gives some nice images to be able to work with. Now, something like this, I, you know, this is just, this is not Leech Lake, but um, I could work with this and carve different pocket depths on this to get my three-dimensional negative contour of, you know, whatever I want here as well. Crow Wing, West Log Lake, and all that stuff. So, it's not going to be as easy going underwater, you know, as it would be above water. Uh, let's go ahead and preview. We're finished uh, calculating. Let's get our preview underway. And while that's uh, going on, let's see here. So, Dave, the um, sanding kit and everything that I bought for my Dremel set... It wasn't anything fancy and all. It was a Lowe's purchase uh, with the Dremel tools. Um, but the uh, the kit includes uh, various uh, sanding uh, rounds, the little disc, um, cutoff wheels, uh, burrs uh, 
for uh, grinding burrs for and I use that a lot for uh, smoothing out my models and getting rid of the fuzzies on the inside edges and on the inside of V cars and things but mostly for the 3d models um, and uh, that kit was probably I mean really inexpensive about 21 25 dollars but uh, give me a moment and I can pull it up on a website and show it to you uh, nothing special as far as a sanding mop, the only real sanding mops I know about, uh, I don't think they would work for Dremels. They would be regular drills uh, and, and drill presses. And also there's a sanding mop for uh, CNC machines. Um, I keep hearing about it. I haven't found it yet, but I keep hearing that there's one where I can just stick the sanding mop in the CNC and run it over the job to sand my 3D carvings. That I, I want to see before anything, but uh, Klingspore's got a uh, in North Carolina. They've got a Klingspore.com. Uh, they've got some uh, nice sanding mops. Um, the uh, Woodcraft Rockler, if you have one in your local area, that would be the best places to go. Uh, I know a really good sanding mop, but it's in Canada, so you, it's gonna, the shipping is a little bit more uh, in things uh, to ship over to the U.S. Uh, but stockroomsupply.ca, uh, uh, Ethan and them over there have a really nice selection of different sanding mops and things. Um, but there's another mop. They're at the woodworking shows with us, and it's actually a really good one. Uh, it's got all the flaps, which I like, and that one is called... Hold on, i got to look that one up because that one's going to stop me. That one is a nice mop. Uh, bear with me a second. It's got some funky not really good name hold on a second uh that one is sanding mop sand flea the sand flea um f l e e that and not the greatest name in the world but sanding uh mop now sand flea now i like the sand flea uh because of the way it's a spongy ball type of thing but it's a the sandpaper is kind of cut into strips and then turned into this ball uh but this one here bear with me i'll pull it over this one here now it's made in korea and i haven't found a replica or anything like it uh, that I'm aware of uh, in the US but this bad boy right here is a nice little I love the little bristles and everything uh, but excellent for contour 3d carving sanding and um, uh, it can it can go into a drill uh, I can't really go into the CNC unfortunately because it's it, it, it sands off the side versus the bottom right you know um you know it sands off the side versus the bottom uh but that is a nice little uh sanding wheel for contour sanding detail contour sanding not very expensive either uh but it is made overseas and i don't know um where you could buy it other than like an ebay or an amazon type of thing but it's phenomenal um these little individual bristles now the sanding mops, I don't know how we got into sanding, but uh, the sanding mops uh, and, 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 and strips and everything, um, these I really like. This is the sand flea, sand flea. It does really well. Uh, but Klingspore uh, has some nice sanding mops. Um, Tree Line USA has some nice ones. I'm not a big fan of. I like the balls uh, and all, but that would be where I would go, you know. But if you ever get a chance to check out that one, get that one a shot because it, it, all those little bristles and all, it gets right down into the 3D model contours. Does a really nice job. All right. That's all I'm talking about sanding there, young man. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Jim, eBay, great place to go. Um, yeah, so right, Howard. So there's yeah, Stockroom's got a, a really uh, 
uh, nice um, supply of uh, of sanding mops. I really like their their uh, sanding mops and stuff. So okay, Howard. So does Stockroom have one like that? Are you talking about the one with the little uh, individual bristles? Uh, are you talking about the one that was kind of like uh, the, the, the sanding cut into strips? Because if it's the one with like the individual bristles, me and old Ethan's going to have a talk because I really want one. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, guys. Let's, um, let's take a look here at our finished carving and all. And let's see uh, how we did on that finish cut. So for the most part, uh, those voids and everything that we were seeing... Uh, they were just basically uh, just hopped right over. So let's kind of, uh, hopefully it doesn't pixelate too much. But let's come up here. And we can see where those divots and all were. But they were pretty much closed off. So our bit didn't like kind of try to bury down into it and get down into that crevice and hole uh, and everything. But we can see where those pits and stuff were, where those openings are. And this would probably be something that where it would be nice to have the 3D modeling tools in Aspire so we could go up and do a little touch up and filling in and stuff and, and sculpting and all to kind of uh, eliminate those voids. But in the long and short of it all, uh, looking at this overall project, I really don't have too big of, I'm not, you know, it's not something that's breaking my heart. I'm not, I don't have really too big of an issue with these with these voids and stuff there's it's not too too like in your face you know what i mean so i, I would be okay with it but <clears throat> it would be nice to you know clean up now if we look closely if we examine this closely here in these uh ravines uh what do you call the uh uh crevice at the at the bottom of a mountain uh, ravine I don't know but we can see tool marks uh, I'm gonna get an education in uh, terminology here but I can see these tool marks and what this is this tool mark is basically the radius of my bit is a little bit too large in diameter and it can't get into these 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 crevices and all so I'm getting a lot of tool marks left behind again not too bad you know it's not gonna break my heart but I may elect, uh, in this case, I would elect to use a smaller end mill, ball nose end mill, uh, to eliminate as much as the tool marks as I can, that I could, you know, and all, and everything. But for the most part, I would be pretty happy with um, this detail. Now, I don't even want to open the door to this, but... Um, the uh, in Aspire there is a function called rest machining and one of these days I will do a video or do a class on rest machining because it's I don't want to get into it right now uh, but with vCarve desktop vCarve Pro and Aspire generally when we create a 3D finish or a 3D rough toolpath it's on the whole visible component the whole visible model right so if I ran a 3d finish with an eighth inch end mill over here and then I wanted to come back and run it with a smaller bit to touch up the detail areas well it's not going to happen in vCarve desktop or pro it's only going to carve that whole model again with a smaller bit you know which is going to double the runtime but with Aspire we have a uh, ability to do what's called rest machining meaning that you can carve uh, the component with a larger ball nose and then once that carving is done we can create a component from the preview and we can trace it to get some trace lines and we can go back and select those vectors those trace vectors and do the rest of the design in the areas with a smaller bit only in the areas only carving in the areas where the larger bit couldn't get into and it's you know it's called rest machining uh, being able to carve the rest of the design where the big bit couldn't get type of thing now a lot of times rest machining um, can kind of uh, reduce time in a sense 
uh, because I can use a larger end mill for the initial finish cut and then come back and do the detail areas with a smaller one. But then, then again, depending on the detail and the design, it may end up just kind of uh, doubling my job time because uh, there may be so many small areas within the design. Um, going back and carving them with a smaller bit is almost like almost like doing the whole job again minus some you know areas that it gonna it's gonna skip and jump over type of thing. And therefore, as far as machining time, that's going to be a hit and miss. It's going to be, you know, it's going to vary. Sometimes it'll reduce your time, uh, giving you great results. Sometimes it'll double your time, still giving you great results type of thing. But it gives you the ability, no matter what, to use a larger bit to do the project and then to come back with a smaller bit and touch up certain areas based on vectors that are created within the software. And uh, it's a nice little feature and function. And one of these days I'll do a class on rest machining uh, to, to show that off. <laughs> All right. Now, let's see what I can do within vcar pro and or desktop uh with my model what ways can i enhance it is there any ways to enhance it uh within you know with my limited tools uh that i have uh 3d modeling tools that i have in in desktop or pro um well one uh, i can go into the properties of my model and i can you know increase uh you know my shape height to get a little bit more detail out of the uh, peaks and things uh, if it's a little bit too much for me i could reduce that shape height down uh, kind of just s uh, subduing the detail maybe not that much uh, but you kind of get the uh, point and stuff now notice, uh, you know, as I'm as I'm changing the height and everything, those voids and all that I got from my file, they're really kind of becoming more and more visible and prominent and stuff. Again, the bit's just gonna kind of skip over those areas. It's not gonna try to plow down into the cut or anything. Um, it would almost look like it looking at all the pinholes in the bottom of my material, right? So what we would end up doing is uh, let's reset this height and looking at all the little pinholes here, let's go ahead and add a zero plane and see if that helps at all fill in those areas, which it does. Okay, it's like patch, it's like patchwork. <laughs> so we can add a zero plane uh, to kind of patch those holes from underneath so we definitely don't want you know if the holes were huge and all then the bit when the bit was small enough it would try to go down and carve down into those models and everything it's just like basically you know carving a concave versus a convex you know it's going to try to get in there so adding a zero plane um, will help kind of fill in and patch in those holes you know so we have you know limited uh, uh, um, options uh, within desktop or pro but we can we can change our heights and stuff um, if this was super crazy if this was super crazy uh, 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 models and details and everything um, and and thick and all we could slice the model and carve it in pieces and all but that I would not recommend for a terrain because all the little parts and everything because you have to glue all the slices back together so I'm not even gonna go there slicing is not gonna be an option uh, for terrain mapping um, what about scaling a Z height so if I've got my model here and let's say I wanted to bring this down to maybe three quarters of an inch thick 
I'm not going to be able to retain my surface detail. I'm not going to be able to emboss this image. Um, uh, I'm going to still have decent detail in here, but not like, you know, with a larger one. Um, now, and, and for the most part, it did, you know, retain uh, some of its height and everything. Um, or detail, not height. I said height, but I meant detail. Now, if we were to look at this with an Aspire program, let's pull up Aspire. Yes, Kevin, I can explain the zero plane. Um, I'll do that right. Give me just a second. I'll do that. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to go with the same 12 by 12. And I'm going to go with the same one and a half inch. Same setup. I'm working off the bottom, touching off the bottom left corner. And let's go into the models and let's import. And this time I'll do the Colorado Springs, Colorado model that I pulled in. Downloads. Had to figure out where I was for a moment there. Uh, model. That should be model three. Should be Colorado Springs, Colorado, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yep. All right. So once again, our models, you know, come in kind of this saying that this is the top. So I want the front what's facing me. So if I choose my front option, uh, we've got our front option here. Um, looking at this model, uh, things look good. I do have one little uh, blemish right over here that I could clean up. Um, but for the most part, that looks good. And I'm going to size this down to my 12 by 12. Click apply. Uh, I'm going to turn into the Y. These five icons over here are different views when you're in this 3D view here. I'm going to click on the Y view. I want to look down the Y axis. And I'm going to uh, bring my model down. I'm going to spin it around, make sure I'm not like cutting myself off or anything. Uh, pretty good let's center it in there getting a little thin on this side uh, with the center so I'm just gonna go just a little bit below center raise it up just a little bit not that much and I want to delete everything or discard everything below the zero plane and click OK okay now uh, we had a, we had a um, great question uh, before I get into sculpting and everything. We had a great question from Kevin: Is can we explain the zero plane? Now the zero plane is um, it's basically it's our it's a surface that we put in. Uh, it's required uh, for the most part when you're working with dishes, you know. Uh, concave dishes and things uh, we need to create a surface plane so we know where to put that dish in um, and um, the zero plane is either going to be created once you create your cove so let's since we're in a spire let's do this I'm gonna turn this mod off just for a second because this is a good question uh, let's go into here create a circle I'm going to go into my modeling tools, create shape. Uh, I'm going to go with a 60 degree, zero base height, no limit, subtract cove, and I'm going to click apply. Okay, looking at this uh, model in the 3D view, 
uh, you can see here that we have this dish. So the zero plane is basically going to create my virtual board uh, and it's going to bring up to uh, my model because if I was trying to carve this dish uh, as it is here, then there would be a tendency of my bit wanting to come off and carve the, the sides and all. So if I come in and I add the zero plane uh, to this, what it does is it brings in my zero plane, which is here, and it brings it in flush with the top. So when I'm carving and all, now my, you know, if I focus on just the model area when I'm carving, then I'm gonna get that nice transition. Now, I, you know, on the properties of the zero plane, I can make uh, adjustments. Uh, I can, there is no shape height. It's all, uh, it's all block. It's all base height type thing. Um, I can reduce uh, my zero plane, uh, which would bring everything kind of uh, below the surface. That's what that zero plane is in a negative. That's what that pink little line is there. Um, I can increase my zero plane. And what it's doing is um, it's creating this virtual top surface here. And it's absolutely required um, with uh, code. So down here, this light tan area is my dish. This red area is my zero plane. So now I've just raised my zero plane above the surface of that dish. And if I were to carve this, uh, models the material, then I'd end up getting a step down here, this deep step down, most likely lip. It probably would not be contoured like that, um, uh, you know, if I was just creating a, you know, a model on my visible component type of thing. So generally, your, let's reset the height here, it comes in at zero. It's basically a zero surface. Uh, Let's see, I'm going to be at Oh shoot. I'm uh changing the wrong component. Hold on a second. Let me get back to my zero plane. I was changing my dish. Let's change my dish. Get back into the zero plane and level that back out to zero and bring it to the top surface. So, the zero plane is required uh when you're working with a dish type of model. Um, but in our case, what we did with the terrain map is it, it created that surface of material uh, and basically kind of uh, filled in the blank. Um, because if you remember, when we were adjusting the model, we were putting that model positioning in the zero plane. And the zero plane is not visible until we add it. But we were, we were creating that. And so when I deleted everything below the zero plane, all those holes and speckles and everything were at the bottom. When I added the zero plane, it closed it off. It put that bottom surface on. Um, it's a um, it's a great way to visualize your design when you create it. Uh, if I didn't have a zero plane, then on my concave, you know, it's hard to kind of visualize what's happening here and stuff. And that's about the only explanation um, that I have for it. It's a virtual surface um, or block of material. Hopefully that... <laughs> Hopefully that explained it somewhat, Kevin. Um, I will... Uh, I'll see if I can get a more definitive answer for that, but that's what it is. It's just a, I, I don't think there is a more, I think that's pretty much explains it, but it might not make sense, but it's a virtual surface uh, that we're creating a zero plane. Okay. This is the top of my board. My top of my board is, you know, not zero, right? The bottom of my board is. Uh, so when it created my zero plane, um, it uh, brought it in. So it sets up my virtual look here of my inch and a half block. Just basically filled in my inch and a half block of wood. It's a material. That's what it is. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. I don't know if that was the 
best dancer in the world. All right, let's uh, let's get back to uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado, and we're gonna come in and uh, there's a few things that I want to do with this. One, I want to show off the sculpting tool, and I'm gonna come in and clean up this little blemish over here. It's probably just a rock in the water. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. Um, got a little bump right there, but I'll probably leave that one. So with my model selected, with my model selected, I'm going to go into my sculpting tools here. And again, this is an Aspire thing, guys. Uh, and uh, with my modeling tools, I'm going to uh, first try just to see if my smoothing tool will uh, clean that up. And no, what it ends up doing is exposing the hole, right? So I'm going to undo or discard those uh, changes. Now, one of the things I can do is on the mode, I you know I can choose the raise mode uh, that um, you know as I'm smoothing out uh, that it's not going to lower it down but it's not going to clean it up either you know I'm sitting here scrubbing on this I can even turn up the strength uh, and I'm not gonna get a whole lot of out of that with the raise mode um, so I'm gonna look at maybe depositing some material or maybe smudging this and kind of filling in the hole so let's try the smudge tool and um, in normal mode and see if I can just kind of and see all I'm doing there is I'm just smudging that hole making it bigger right don't want to do that so we'll discard that so the only thing left for me is to fill in the hole deposit material in there and for this I don't want a whole lot uh, you know a whole big diameter there I'm just gonna kind of get right over this hole uh, and I'm going to kind of uh, fill it in and let's see if we can twiddle this view. Got that whole peak and everything there. Uh, twiddling the view means moving it around. Didn't want to move that way. I wanted to kind of come over here. And And my smooth tool is just not doing it for me. I want to get right in that hole. I don't want to be too much around it. So I'm going to come with a very small diameter and see if I can just build that material up. Get it right above the surface. And then see if I can kind of let's turn down uh, the smoothness a bit that hole might be there to stay because it's just not letting me fill in right 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 uh, let's see here let's I'm gonna turn off the preserved transparency and let's see what we can do there I'm going to start smudging some of this material over. I 
I'm pulling some of this material over from Let's, let's add a little bit. And then we'll do some smoothing. There we go. All right. So we'll keep those changes. Click OK. So it's just a matter of kind of, uh, I think it might be a lake. No, uh, Chuck, it, I mean, it could have very well be, depending on what I have. But I think, uh, I don't know that much about Colorado, but all of this flat land here, uh, I thought the way it looked on the map that that was a lake, but or that, that this lower area was the lake, uh, or water at least of some sort. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I could be wrong again. I don't know that much about uh, Colorado, but let's uh, let's get this spun around here, and um, it might have been a lake. It could have been, uh, but I didn't want that hole. It was a, it was a decent sized little hole. Uh, I didn't want that hole there, and now of course where I filled in, you know, you can kind of obviously see uh, where I was pulling that material over to this area from this angle. It's this area up here in the corner. Looks like a, looks like a alligator swimming in the water, doesn't If you look real, wait, hold on, if I quit moving. Stay. Doesn't that look like an alligator head and swimming in the water? Anyway, uh, if I go back to, if I grab that model, <laughs> we got alligators down here. Um, if I go back into uh, the sculpting tools a little bit, I'm going to smooth that out just a little bit more. Um, let's get my diameter bigger. Okay, there we go. Don't need that alligator's head in there. All right. Okay. So... The whole point of this is, I mean, it would be the same steps, you know, creating the rough cut, then the finish cut and everything, but I wanted to bring the model into Aspire uh, just to be able to kind of show that, the, you know, we have tools. Uh, we have our sculpting tools and things that we need, um, you know, uh, that we can specify. Um, we can, you know... Uh, do a lot of things with this. I mean, if I wanted to build up the peaks, I, you know, I could. Um, but one of the things that one of the things that helps with Aspire is, you know, I have this model here, and I've got it as an OBJ. But if it was an STL or something, and, and, and everything uh, that I bring in, uh, I could do the carving, and I have the ability to export it out as you know a regular 3d clip art that you know I can you know have in my uh, clip art layer um, I can export it out as that grayscale 3d bitmap type of thing um, you know I can create a component um, of it so I have a, a few extra tools that are at my disposal with Aspire than I do with VCar Pro and all but the whole point of all this is to just kind of show you like if there were some blemishes and things how we can use our sculpting tool uh, to come in and uh, touch up a little bit, you know, uh, to get to fill in those holes or, you know, uh, block them off. All right, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? Uh, again, to, uh, let's see if I can, what would be the best way to do this? Um, if you got a pen and paper, See if I can make the font big. All right. So we talked about it. Uh, topo, topo.io. 
okay? Uh, these are gonna be mostly OBJ files, uh, but we can grab images and things off them as well. We can save images and, and, and all. Um, but these are mostly gonna be OBJ files, uh, which are real good. A, another uh, site um, that uh, we took a look at uh, was, Uh, let's see here. Earth Explorer dot USGS dot gov. Okay. This is, uh, you know, we can pull some uh, GeoTIFF type files off of here. Um, now, with GeoTIFF and all, there is some uh, uh, beforehand work that we can do. It's generally imported, uh, like a, just like a grayscale image would be imported and all. Um, it would require a, um, most likely a Spire. I don't know if we're gonna be able to, we, we, well, we may be able to bring it in in VCar Pro and desktop. I will have to confirm that and put that down in the comments, or the, yeah, the comment section or the description of the video. But um, GIMP, so GIMP.org, uh, this is a photo editing software uh, and it has a great um, uh, oh my goodness, what is the word? GNU, GNU, um, image manipulation. Um, so photo editor. Um, that you may want to check out. Uh, another thing, you know, Google Maps, you know, these type of, uh, you know, files, um, you, you may be able to even pull off um, from Google Maps, you know, a different place. I don't know why my cop locks is on. Let's try that one more time. But uh, let's see here. One link that... I didn't go into a whole lot of discussion about is the Paul Roundtree uh, link and I'm just gonna copy and paste that over here I don't want to try to type it in but this is uh, a little uh, dim file Wrangler and STL conversion and things um, and then the last one It's going to be dim files as well. And you'll be able to pause this during playback and, and write these down or copy and paste. You can't copy and paste off a video, but you know what I mean. Um, so this one, uh, this is now this is actually a direct link to like the Mount, Mount St. Helen uh, index. But what we're what we're focusing on is uh, the GIS.ESS. But let's take and let's put this into a web browser real quick. Copy. Go into a web browser, and we'll come back to that little uh, notepad here in a moment. Okay, and let's see here. So it looks like on with this link, uh, there's a lot of resources. Um, Yeah, these are LiDAR data. Um, nice. So you can click here for a three meter dim file and they're big, um, you know, uh, for the most part. Now this is only 1.7 gigabytes, but I mean, they can get up to 40 gig for a file depending on what it is that you're doing. But, 
There's a few, um... Okay. There's a few little uh, resources within within this little link here, and this is the gis.ess.washington.edu, Washington Education from Washington State, and so digital raster graphics now in GeoTIFF format right here. Um, so. We can, yeah. So TIFF file, as you click on any of these images, uh, it pulls it down as a TIFF, a GeoTIFF file. Nice. Um, all right, let's go back to our little notepad. And is there anything else? Oh, uh, with the DIM files and things, um, we may need a regular grid importer and that's going to be in the uh, vetric gadgets now i'm sorry for you desktop folks that you know because you unfortunately don't have a, a access to uh the gadgets um but uh this is going to be https slash gadgets And what we're looking for is the regular grid importer gadget. You know, and let's uh, let's go to that link, and it'll tell us all about what that gadget is. So let's copy this. And let's pop on over to the Vetric website. And we want our regular grid importer gadget. And so uh, basically it converts point cloud files. Uh, and um, uh, point cloud type scans into a 3D component. Uh, it supports many file formats uh, providing data with captured and regular grid format. So, those GeoTIFF files, uh, the DIM files. Um, here's a sample of uh, Mount St. Helen DIM file download from here. So uh, in this tutorial and everything, how it works, the gadget is used to convert the point cloud into a 3D component. It accepts all file formats with the following conditions, okay? The data must be captured in a regular grid scan with points evenly distributed, which is what most of those uh, DIM files and GeoTIFF files are. The file should contain rows with the coordinates information, X, Y, and Z components to the line scans, which generally they do. Uh, the coordinates in each line should be separate, either by a single space or a comma, and rotary data is not supported, so you can't use it for your fourth axis type of deal. Um, but, uh, definitely, um, a gadget worth exploring and all with some of those uh, links and everything um, and all okay all right you can even do uh, satellite and scientific data I don't have any links for science or scientific data um, You know, but I want to thank uh, Vetric for the information they gave me. Uh, I don't know if I translated it well, you know, to you, regurgitated it well to you in a sense. Um, but I tried to take the best notes I could. And if you have ever have any questions, you can always post a comment in the video section. I'd be happy to answer them type of thing. So let's see here. Right, right, exactly. Uh, let's see here, Chuck. Could you show me uh, that REST tool setting 
where it can, uh, what it can do, uh, some fine finish cutting, the bigger bits not get to. So rest machining. Um, it's only available in a spire uh, chuck. And basically within the rest machining is we can come in and we can create a tool path. Now I know I just added that tool. Bear with me a second there. I know I just added that tool. All right, I gotta add it to this one. I'm in Aspire now. Um, this is not the program. This is not the computer I usually do my design work on. It has all my tools on there, uh, but. Oops, sorry, wrong place. Uh, that is a eighth inch uh, pass depth. Is All right, so I'll go ahead and calculate that tool path. Now, um, a nice video uh it is our competition but you know hey we're all out there giving information and all but on youtube dot com let me see if i can find the link and i'll paste it in the uh chat group All right, in the chat room, I'm pasting a link. Let's see if it lets me paste it. Uh, there's a link uh, for a video uh, by uh, the guys and girls over at Legacy CNC. Uh, they did a, it's about a 30 minute video. They have a couple of videos on rest machining and um, they go through the process very well. The, um, there's no sense in me reinventing the wheel uh, and it, that would be a whole class uh, on rest machining. I'm just gonna basically uh, touch on some of the points here but i'm not going to go into the whole detail uh chuck you can click on that link and watch a step-by-step -step tutorial on rest machining it's not a tool it's not a button that you click um and vetric okay jim throws out uh that vetric has a video on rest machining as well so you don't have to watch our competition <laughs> I'm just kidding. Legacy, uh, the guys over there do great jobs. I love their tutorials. They they actually do a really nice job with their tutorials. And all. And uh, let this finish calculating. The key to um, the rest machining is is with Aspire, we have the ability to create a component. Um, to create a component from not only a picture, but our toolpath preview, uh, you know, our preview window 
from another visible model. We, you know, we can make something and, and turn that into an actual component, save it as a file to our clip art database and stuff. Um, so these tools being able to create these components from these different views or other components type things gives us the ability to take our carving uh, that we're about to preview and turn that preview into a component uh, to then uh, from there we can trace um, that component and highlight the areas um, where the bit really could not get into and then we can tr trace that area to create the vectors and we can run another finishing toolpath with a smaller bit with those vectors selected and you'll see that as soon as this is finished calculating <clears throat> And I probably could have been more practical and really showed the dramatics if I would have done like a quarter inch end mill and then, then back to a 16th type of thing. But we'll do 8th and 16th or 8th and 32nd or something like that. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to be go in, you know, there's a, there's a quite a few videos out there. Uh, Jim points out that Vetric has one, so most likely that's in the uh, Vetric library tutorial or Vetric uh, channel on YouTube, which has a lot of information. Oh my goodness, a lot of videos there. Um, but uh, also the link that I just provided for the Legacy CNC, uh, Legacy CNC rest machining. All right, with this um, toolpath calculated, we can go into and let it uh, switch me over to the preview. Uh, we can go ahead and preview that selected toolpath. Let it cut it out. And while this is calculating and stuff, uh, if y'all have any questions uh, at all uh, that I could answer, uh, let me know. And then after this, we're going to go ahead and call it an early night uh, because there's not a, it's really not a complicated uh, project. Now, of course, when you get into the dims, and, and that's a whole, we, we, we may come back and kind of do a, like a part two on this or even a part three and look at creating uh, using the dim files, um, you know, using GIMP uh, to adjust those GeoTIFFs. So we may make a little series out of this. This is just the first part. Uh, really wanting to focus on the topotopo.io, which has been great. Uh, everything that I've typed in, it's always created a, a model for me of that area and everything. I haven't really found any dead zones, you know, that haven't been that, that within their database, but I'm sure there are, you know, I'm sure there are. All right, so uh, with our finished uh, carving here, um, I can go ahead up to my model tool and I can create a component from and I want to create a component from my toolpath preview. However, I want to hold the control key when I calc when I click this option. I don't want to just click that option and just create a component. I want basically I'm kind of creating a negative in a sense. I want to hold the control key and create a component from the toolpath preview. Okay, now I can go over and look at my uh, toolpath preview here. Let's turn off my model. And you can see uh, I'm only getting these areas here. These are the areas that the bigger bit really couldn't get into. So now what I need to do is I don't want my bit, my small bit having to carve this whole surface again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my drawing tools 
and I'm going to trace. Let's get back into our 2D view. Let me get rid of my circle here. Still got my circle there. All right, let's pull up this in a full view. Now on the trace tool, on the trace tool, I'm gonna use the black and white option. And what I'm looking for is if I slide my slide bar all the way to the minimum to where I have my full white screen, my full white screen here, I'm gonna slowly, and I got a roller wheel on my mouse, so if you click on this, you can use that roller wheel on your mouse to go tick by tick, basically. And so I want to you know, come in probably just that one tick. If I go too far, right, gray. If I go too far this way, white. So I want just that one click, that one click from here, I get these white areas. These are the areas that I want my smaller bit to come back and machine. So I'm gonna come down, I want to, um, I'm gonna use the default corner fit, the default noise, and I wanna preview this, all right? Uh, now, some of these areas, uh, looking at them, you know, they're gonna be small areas. I may not want, you know, to bother my, have my little bit, if unless I'm using like a 32nd inch tip bit. Uh, I may not want it to, you know, try to capture all these areas. So what I may do is I may turn up my noise filter a bit and preview again and kind of remove some of those areas and just really focus on the larger areas versus those smaller ones right uh, however you want to do that and now I can uh, come in to my toolpath and create another finished toolpath make sure that here's the key thing don't create a toolpath let me go into back into my modeling tab. Don't create a toolpath on the tool the 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 uh, toolpath preview. Make sure you turn that back off, and turn your model back on. Okay. Um, make sure you turn that back on, uh, that model, and all. And what I want to do is I want to kind of move this back, and. Oh, have your um, let me put that back down here I want it back here have your vectors selected did I not click apply guys did I not click apply or did I have it on bear with me a second let's pop back over here did I not click apply when I trace that let me go back into the modeling tab and turn that uh, layer back on and I have no trace vectors, so I didn't. So let's go back into that trace tool. Always click apply to uh, lock it in. All right, so uh, one more time, we're going to uh, just get that one click, you know, right there. Um, preview, apply, lock it in there. All right, now we've got some vectors. Um, I'm going to... Uh, I don't necessarily want this border in here. So I need to come and take a look and make sure what all vectors are tied into that border. I gotta, I gotta close them off. So we gotta do a little bit of node editing. Let me turn this model off uh, now so we have just our uh, vector lines so you can see them. So we got a little bit of uh, cleaning to do. So um, I'm gonna go into node editing and I'm going to uh, cut the vector here, cut the vector here, okay? And then I'm going to end up joining this vector with just, since it's right at the edge of my board, I'm just gonna join it together with a, a straight line, okay? But it cuts that free. Uh, let's see here, I have nothing going on down the left edge, but down at the bottom, my border comes up into this area and all. So I'm gonna cut this vector on the corner. I'm gonna cut it
I'm gonna cut it uh, where do I want to cut it I'll cut it here and I'm going to take this and uh, let's draw a line straight down and I don't mind if I go over my board a little bit um, I don't mind if I go over my board a little bit because I don't have any clamps in the way. I'm going to take these two vectors and I'm going to join them together as one open. You know, I still want that one open. And then I'm going to take this whole entire bottom vector and I'm going to join it pretty much with a straight line. Okay. Uh, that's just going to create this straight line here. Now, if I want to uh, ensure that my bit can fit in there, uh, I could go into node editing mode and I could pull this line down a little bit here off of my board, come all the way to the very end. Oops, undo that. See if I can find the two nodes. Let's cut it here, or let's put that back where it was. Bear with me a second. Cut the vector here just for a moment so I can separate my two lines. This goes up, this one goes down. And then I'll rejoin them with a straight line. That will uh, allow my bit to go in and kind of get in all these little small areas here. Um, all right, what else do I need to, on this side here, I cut this one loose. So again, I'm going to use my polyline tool. I'm going to snap to this line. I'm going to come down a little bit, uh, wrap the corner, and I'm only going to go to here. Spacebar to finish, and I'm going to take and go back into node editing mode. Cut the vector here. And I'm going to take these two. And I'm going to join them off with a straight line. Okay. Close that up. Type deal. All right, now I should be able to just go through and select the uh, rest of this boundary here and delete it up here. This one all the way down to here and delete that. Uh, I can come in and select all of my vectors and I want to use this time, I'm gonna use a very small uh, ball nose. In this case, I'm gonna use my 32nd inch uh, ball nose um, and I'm going to Use the selected vectors as the boundary. Click calculate. A three, oh, <laughs> it would help if we had our model turned back on. Make sure you turn your model on. Not the toolpath preview, but the actual model. There we go. Now calculate. Okay. Give it a second to go through and calculate all those small areas. And so now it's only going to carve in those areas doing the little touch up uh, and things. Um, now, with, now this is the Colorado map. If we would have done the Rocky, we'd have had a lot of different, you know, more vectors uh, that we could have uh, obtained. Uh, there was very little cleanup required with this one. Um, but, and that essentially is rest machining where we create our model, we carve the model with a larger diameter bit, we create a component from that toolpath preview after previewing it, but we hold the control key down when we're doing that, it creates this kind of negative image. Uh, with that, uh, we can then go in and trace that negative area and create a toolpath to carve it that 
those traced vectors uh, with our smaller bit only coming and doing that touch up. And that is rest machining. Okay. All right. So uh, this is almost done calculating. And then after this calculates and we preview, we're going to go ahead and call it a night unless uh, um, somebody else has another question. But this is only a function available in a spire. Rest machining is only a function available in a spire. <clears throat> All right. So we'll come in and preview uh, that selected toolpath. And let's see if I can uh, animate the bit, at least show the bit. Let's uh, spin this up and zoom in a little bit. Let's pull this up here. All right, once again, we'll preview the selected toolpath. <laughs> Hopefully this doesn't cause a lot of buffering. But that little bit uh, will then go back in and just do all the little detail work, cleaning up the detail. And watch in some of those deeper valleys and everything, watch as how the tool marks, you know, get removed by that smaller bit. So that smaller bit just runs around, jumps around, and, and does all the touch-up work and on. You can you can see, uh, I don't want it to cause a lot of buffering, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop. But you know, uh, you can see how it just goes back and kind of cleans up those little valleys and everything. And that's what the rest machining uh, toolpath does. Now I'm gonna go ahead and stop that here. So because I have a feeling that it's gonna buffer like bananas uh, on us, um, and. Uh, if we were to look at machining times and things overall, the, you know, because there's a lot of detail in this, we're look. It's going to be a big, a big, big bunch of hours. Now, the um, and this is where that rest machining may pay off or may not pay off type of thing. So my 3D cut with my eighth inch ball nose bit as it is, and now I have a lot of wasted. A lot of wasted space that bit traveling up and down here I would eliminate that clean that up proficiently to re reduce that tool time because my bit doesn't need to be moving up and down like that uh, and that's a matter of the tool path um, most likely the offset um, <clears throat> but uh, we're looking at about six hours 49 minutes um, now the rest machining using a 32nd inch tip bit going back and cleaning up all those touch up areas and everything uh, based on my step over based on my bit settings and everything for my bit running uh, at a speed of um, 45 inches a minute uh, 20 on the plunge um, the toolpath the 3d the, the rest machining toolpath is going to be actually longer 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 than the actual carving itself and this is where sometimes it pays sometimes it doesn't to do rest machining in this case i have to really juggle uh is it going to be worth another nine hours to get into those little valleys and everything, all these little spots, all these blue spots and all, and touch them up. Um, that would definitely be a hard judgment call. Uh, probably not. 
but it all really depends. Um, when I finished my first carving, I'd move the router out of the way. Before I unclamp everything, I'd look it over really good. And then I would make that call type of thing. But probably not for another nine hours. I, I don't know. I don't know. Mike, you have a wonderful night. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, good night, Mike. Uh, I'm not sure uh, there's a delay. You guys will most likely be gone by the time um, uh, you hear that answer. Uh, I went ahead and typed it in. But All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to go ahead and end the class here. Uh, I want to thank you for spending the night uh, uh, hanging out with me and just talking about the possibility of terrain maps. Uh, it, this has been something that uh, has always interested me and uh, like I said um, I was able to uh, learn a little bit more about it myself and I wanted to share the information with you hopefully I did an okay with share uh, okay with kind of uh, you know uh, forwarding or sharing that information and um, uh, I really hope you guys uh, give this a try we will probably uh, come into um, we will probably come into a maybe a series of this or do a continuation of this in another class. I don't think it'll be next week, but uh, we'll probably do a continuation of this and, and like explore uh, getting a, a geo tiff file coming in and uh, you know working with it how we would have to work with it and then creating the file. So. Thank you, Kevin. That was very nice of you to say. All right. Uh, until next time, guys and girls, I'll see you soon.